Very rarely were low-end graphics cards any good, usually struggling with the releases of the time, yet alone being able to handle what the future would hold. However, there was an exception to this rule. This right here is the ATI Radeon X300 SE. Not that it's really much of a difference from the standard variants, although by default this variant can take advantage of your system RAM better than the other versions can actually do so. Based on the RV370 architecture, it was released in late 2004 with 4 pixel shaders and a core clock of 325MHz, along with 64MB of DDR RAM clocked in at 200MHz. It was a single slot solution that used well under 30 watts under full load, with many units never coming even close to this mark. It supports DirectX 9 and OpenGL 2.0, although OpenGL does tend to have some issues on certain operating systems out there. It does work on all of today's OS's provided you install the drivers right, so why don't we take the card inside from out of the rain and find out a little bit more about what makes this card different. So to understand a little bit more about this thing, we have to go back to the days of the Radeon 9550 and Radeon 9600. Very good mid-range offerings that offer themselves as cut-down variants of the 9000 series, outperforming the vast majority of the lower-end NVIDIA 4 series offerings, as well as competing strongly in the mid-range and usually beating them there too, while ending up being better value for money. Now, these things are based on the same architecture as the X300, as the X300 is pretty much the exact same as the 9550, but only the lower-end variant with the 64-bit memory bus, as if you compare the higher-end 9550s, it will in fact beat the X300. Now we're going to be testing the performance of the X300 at stock today, as MSI Afterburner isn't keen on overclocking these old graphics cards, and usually for overclocking I'd recommend an OS that isn't Windows 10 for such an old GPU. However, Windows 10 will work perfectly fine with these drivers, but the newest ones are for Windows Vista, which means that you need to download the drivers from the AMD website and then select the INF file, which isn't too annoying to do and takes all of 20 seconds, but you do need to make sure you know what you're doing. So we've already established that it performs decently for a mid-range Radeon card on release and has working drivers today. But best of all, they're cheap. Extremely cheap. This thing is £3 from CEX and even cheaper on eBay, and you can pick them up all over boot fairs and anywhere in the UK, really, and I'm pretty sure most markets will have them available. As many OEMs like Dell, Compaq and the like started to stick these in PCs as much as they could, with bulk purchases making them extremely cheap to do so. This card came in at roughly £30 to purchase just shortly after release to a consumer, so you can imagine how cheap it was to OEMs who bought them in bulk. So why don't we see just how good it is to game on a £30 card from 14 years ago, and if it deserves the good reputation it had, or if it's just nostalgia fogging my memory. First up I thought I'd give Unigine Heaven a bit of a test, but regards to the API or driver selected, or even the operating system I decided to use, the program would just run like this, which could be due to the RAM allocations as the card wasn't utilised at all by the software, and led me to believe that modern applications may prove to be a bit of an issue with cards like this. But contrary to what we just saw, I fired up Minecraft, admittedly an older version, as the latest versions would just crash whenever we tried to start them. We saw 52 FPS on average with the fast settings in the 720p resolution, but generally opting for as low resolution as possible would be the best way to play the game with a card like this. When loading chunks given the card was utilising our RAM as VRAM, it could hitch up momentarily for maybe 5-10 to 10 seconds of frame drops, but for a card that is 7 years older than this title, hitting near 60 FPS in the HD resolutions isn't bad by any means at all. Another newer title from 10 years after the card was initially released with one of my favourite city builders in recent years, which is Banished. The card was able to run with around 29 FPS on average, which would then shoot up if you zoomed in a bit. This was with the lower settings and the lower resolution as well as the DX9 renderer, as higher options would cripple performance majorly, which is something that did plague the card even on release with those high resolutions not even being an option you can look at. Personally I don't mind, but considering how much benchmark footage I have of me actually just playing the game on this system, you can get away with playing it absolutely fine. Also zooming in and out rapidly would cause our 0.1% lows, which is where we could see issues with the streaming of details and likely that RAM configuration. Overall though, for a recent title it was very playable. As for a game that I actually grew up playing, this is Command & Conquer Generals which I ran with the lower setting selected, and albeit a 32fps average was achieved with a rather low resolution, the game was more than playable, and was actually sort of how I remember experiencing the game. 
I forgot how intensive this game actually used to be and it was one of the main reasons that I actually upgraded to a slightly better system. Overall it was playable, but I would have expected a bit better performance in a game like this given how old it is and how powerful the card actually was. And to say the results were disappointing was a bit of an understatement, but I feel that a card like this should be performing a little bit better given from the performance we've just seen in two way newer titles. Still the likes of newer simpler titles like Battlefront 2 ran alright with 36 FPS on average, which could sometimes hover around the 50 to 60 FPS region in some of the simpler maps and less intensive scenes. But to give you an idea of a worst case scenario, we saw 36 FPS on average in the 800x600 resolution with the low setting selected and the game did look alright and the visual clarity up from the 480i a lot of people are used to seeing from the consoles was quite nice. But still, it's nice to see how this can run moderately intensive titles from around the card's release with decent frame rates that are somewhat competitive. Half-Life 2 is a good example of how a minor change in resolution can affect the card. Admittedly, we were using the one on the latest Source engine as the original release would run way better, but in 720p the game was rather slow, hitting around 30fps at the majority of the time, which isn't really ideal for a game like this. But when I decided to drop the resolution ever so slightly down to 800x600, we saw the game run much smoother with an average FPS of around 70fps, with 1% lows down to 42fps and 0.1% lows down to 39fps. So all in all a very smooth experience, which would be even smoother if you used an older version of the Source engine, and nice to see from a card this old. Games like Morrowind, which feature large open worlds, nice texture work as well as nice water and shaders, all came together with a smooth frame rate of around 52fps, 1% lows down to 42fps and 0.1% lows down to 15fps, which showed that throughout our time playing the game was fine, even in combat, although I could see heavy towns and cities causing larger slowdown than what we saw here. Overall, I doubt they'd be too intensive, as it was a very smooth experience on the card and had good clarity given the higher resolution than the original Xbox variant. RimWorld was a good one, but completely unplayable on the system due to the poor OpenGL support on the card. Unfortunately, as well as its unique memory setup, it ensured that the game just showed up as a large purple blob with a few sprites that showed up properly, and the game running actually correctly in the background and it is playable, but you just can't see what you're doing. So it doesn't matter that you saw 31 FPS on average with somewhat okay settings, as the game didn't run. Older titles like Quake 3's time demo ran at a fluent 77fps on average, which is where the card really shines, as even in 102 4x768, the card could handle the highest settings while maintaining a very competitive experience overall, as you could definitely handle pretty much all other 90s FPS games at very fluent frame rates with very nice settings, which is something a card like this would be ideal for given its plug and play nature and allowing it to fit into most systems, even SFF ones, which would be nice for a retro gaming PC. Finally, in terms of gaming, we had GTA San Andreas with the low and medium option selected, with the 800x600 resolution ensuring that the game had plenty of detail on show, with a silky smooth 63fps average. Although our frame times were alright overall, the game did hitch up when loading some new areas as shown by the 0.1% low results. But this was only momentary and pretty much every situation saw the game pinned to that 60fps mark and increasing the settings would be similar to Half-Life 2 and would completely destroy gaming performance. But I did mention retro gaming, didn't I? Well, originally just over a year ago when this video was a work in progress called the X300 The Composite King, and why was it called that? Well, the card does have native composite output, which is incredibly useful for your retro gaming needs. Now, I originally filmed a lot of this video on a £50 phone and when I hardly knew how to actually film, but the general gist of it was that if you use the CRT MU drivers on an OS like XP or 7 or Vista, it makes controlling and outputting to a CRT much easier, allowing for 240p or 480i over composite, with near instantaneous latency. Now, you get some of the issues associated with composites such as compressed colours and colour banding, and I'm much more of an advocate for RGB which the card does support with a breakaway cable, but not all TVs have that. And the main thing is that the games were extremely playable on the TV with the likes of Halo and Half-Life 2 all running at a fluent 60fps because of the resolution, and of course we had the heightened settings because we had the actual breakaway from running with those high settings that we need for a PC monitor. 
all while benefiting with the smoothness of the CRT and the warm picture quality. The drivers even have dedicated options allowing you for controlling the output to the CRT, as all in all I remember it being a great experience to use with a small CRT TV that you might have previously just thrown away, and can vouch for it as a retro gaming option given how easy it is to plop and play in any PC. As long as you limit your scope to the 90s era of consoles, you can actually get away with some emulation, but don't expect to even look at some of those newer consoles like the GameCube, as this card is not powerful enough for things like that. Overall, it is a very versatile little card personally for those older titles, and this might actually persuade some of you to buy it if you're looking for something to output to a CRT with. So in conclusion, the X300 is a card that never really deserves to be hated. It never really was, and the card is just very convenient to use, easy to use, supports lots of games, has composite output, and will pretty much always has a purpose for these reasons. Now, the main bad press I've been seeing from people is people that ended up with it from an old OEM PC, and then they're being upset that their card from 2004 isn't running all those games. Now, I don't get that, because this card is 14 years old and is perfectly admirable considering how well it performs in even newer titles like Banished, and of course Minecraft and simpler titles like that. I'm not going to claim it's perfect, 1080p desktop usage on an OS like Windows 10 with transparency enabled can be rather sluggish, especially dragging around hardware accelerated windows like Discord, but you can't fault the card as in lower resolutions like 720p and 900p, there's no lag associated with these tasks, and when you turn off transparency or use an OS like like Windows XP, you can run it in 1080p absolutely fine. Those new operating systems can be a bit of a pain in the ass to install drivers, but they're not too hard to do because all you have to do is install an INF file, which is not hard to do so by any means. All in all, I've enjoyed my experience with the X300, and I've even used the mobile version on the first laptop I ever really had, and even then that was still remarkably usable, and I should really review that laptop at some point as it's the reason I ended up getting Steam. Anyway, thank you very much for watching, Good night. So the next few uploads on the channel might be a little bit different from the usual content, as I've been experimenting around making a few different reviews on a few different things, so expect a few cut changes, but the usual content will be resuming. You can like and subscribe if you liked this video, or dislike if you didn't, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.